Hello, friends. Good to see you again. And it is windy out there. I kept my hat on while I was preaching, but uh, the wind wanted to lift it several times. It's a beautiful day out there, a fall day. The trees are just tipping to get their new color for fall. So I hope you get outdoors in it some. Today, we're going to read Daniel 10. It matches Revelation 17 and 18. We really have to lay some groundwork in our little visit today uh, before we can talk about or discuss Daniel 10 next week. So today will be a little groundwork, but we're still going to read Daniel 10 to kick us off. And before I read, I want to pray. Almighty Father, we come to you again, asking for your presence as we read your word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel 10. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 10. Last week, our topic uh, for our little visit was about so many churches and how am I going to choose one? So our, our last week's topic was observe the churches. There are a lot of them, but observe them. Here's Daniel 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Ophaz. His body was also like the burl and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness, my beauty, was turned into me in turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for to you I am now sent. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before God, your words were heard, and I am come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make you understand what will befall your people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words to me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him that stood before me, O oh, my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me and I have re retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me straightway there remained no strength in me. 
neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. And I said, and he said, O oh man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be to you, be strong, yes, be strong. And when he had spoken to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, do you know where I come from to you? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece will come. But I will show you that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is no one that holds with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. I actually love that chapter because the connection between a praying person and the angels are so strong in that chapter. So our lesson today is about observing their sources of information or inspiration. If we're looking around at all the many churches, that's one thing to observe. Part of Babylon is the false prophet who works miracles and deceives people. One of the marks of the bride is that she has the prophetic gift of the spirit. It seems obvious then that there are false prophets and true prophets. The false prophet speaks to Babylon. The true gift of prophecy speaks to the bride. So what is prophecy? Just how are these two churches enlightened or led or inspired? I need to walk back over some history here. Remember that in the garden, God told Adam and Eve that if they ate of this tree, they would die. Death would be the consequence of sin. When Satan appeared as a serpent in the tree, he said, you will not die. It was a blatant, outright lie. Satan has been trying to perpetrate that, perpetuate that lie ever since. I move on through history into Israel's time when Saul sensed that God had given him up to his own choices, for he had chosen to go against God, refusing to listen to the prophet. Saul decided he would visit someone who supposedly could talk to people who had died but we're not dead. The passage in First Chronicles indicates that because of Saul's transgression to go visit someone who had a familiar spirit, who could talk to the spirits of the dead or was a medium, because of that sin, Saul died in the next battle. <clears throat> Isaiah tells how to test prophetic sayings. He says, God asks, should my people go to people that peep and mutter and think they talk with dead people for answers? He answers his own question. No, no, look instead to the law and to the testimony. The law is the Ten Commandments. The testimony of Jesus is the prophetic gift of the Spirit. No matter if they come back from the dead, if they do not speak according to the law and to the testimony, if they do not agree with the commandments of God and the prophetic gift of the spirit, then God says there is no light in them. I may test for true or false prophets by whether or not they agree with the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Bible, which came by the prophetic gift of the spirit. Now, Babylon does have a prophetic source. The Bible says Babylon is filled up with foul and unclean spirits. Satan continually tells his lie that people do not die when they die. Satan chose an arena of human experience that is impossible of scientific examination, death. And he thoroughly contradicts the plain word of God. He says, no, they are not dead. And so they come back to inspire Babylon's leaders. 
I am very concerned today about the number of world leaders who are in touch with occult communicators and make their decisions for the world by these communications. Instead of spirits of the dead, which is the prophetic source, or what is the prophetic source for God's church? God has placed people in his church who are filled with the Holy Spirit with the gift of prophecy. Some Christians call it the spirit of prophecy, as phrased in Revelation 19.10. The inspiration of the bride comes from the Holy Spirit through his gift of prophecy. The inspiration of Babylon comes from the spirits of devils. Perhaps it is new to you that the Bible is so hard on people who presumably talk to the dead. Perhaps you thought people could come back after they die. You are not alone. Many people today puzzle over this. For some, the puzzle may reside around the word soul. Many think that the soul lives on. But in Genesis 2-7, it indicates that the soul is the entire human. I am a soul. You are a soul. In Ezekiel 18, there is the declaration that the soul that sins will die. So souls die. They do not just go on after the body dies. Dust is the body. It returns to dust or earth. The breath goes back to God because God gave it in the first place. Now, for others, the puzzle may reside around the word spirit. They think surely it is the spirit that goes on living. But twice in Job, spirit is used in parallelism as a synonym for breath. The spirit is simply breath, which returns to God who breathed it into Adam's nostrils. So what does the Bible call death? Sleep. Psalm 146 says that in that very day, their thoughts perish. They do not think at all, not even having dreams as in sleep. Is that the end? Oh no, those who sleep will awake. Later, I will examine with you the two resurrections mentioned in Daniel 12 and John 5. It seems clear to me from scripture that the dead cannot come back to guide me. If I will be guided by supernatural forces, I hope to choose a true prophet. And I expect to find a true prophet connected with a church that meets the characteristics of the remnant. They keep the commandments of God, they keep the faith of Jesus, and they have the prophetic gift of the Spirit. Now, the Spirit gives many and varied gifts. Not everyone is a prophet, for sure. Not everyone has every gift. Some people think a Christian must talk in tongues if he or she has the Spirit but the spirit gives the gifts however he wills and not everyone has the same gift. It matters to me very much in a church setting or in any group setting that each participant discover what he or she is happy doing. I encourage you to volunteer outside church, outside your group, volunteer with things that matter to you, that make you happy. God has given you some very special gifts, and in using them, you will feel fulfilled. As I use my gifts, I discover more and more about myself, and I learn to share that in a helpful way with the church. Because of my understanding of spiritual gifts, I believe the church should be a place where I can get to know myself, my gifts, my need of God, 
where I can find people with whom to be honest about myself and God. I believe church is a place where I can find my contentment in God and therefore have freedom to continue to discover and deal with my deepest motives, my deepest thoughts, my deepest feelings. That is the 10th law of recovery. Content in him, we have freedom to continue to discover and deal with our deepest motives, thoughts, and feelings. I can observe and actually test the visible churches on earth today to see which ones make room for this law of recovery. Which ones believe and teach spiritual gifts and especially which ones claim to have the gift of prophecy. I can look for a church that keeps the 10 commandments, claims to have that prophetic gift and overcomes by faith in Jesus. By observing the churches today, by observing their prophets, you can choose and belong to the bride of Christ. One more next week. Now we have some stories about beauty. This one about depth. I'm walking home from school in Wisconsin. Today was the first day of school this year and right now the walk home has gotten hot. I'm walking along the fence row of a pasture where a few yards away the woods begins. Looking at the cool shade under those woods and the green carpet beneath, I long to follow after the cows who gather there. I've had this longing many times, even while riding along through the countryside. I see a welcoming pastoral scene, and I think I could just get out of the car and wrap that pastoral scene right around me. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes we stop the car and go walking into the scene, and then the scene disappears as I watch my step around cow hillocks or protruding rocks that I didn't notice from the road. I can revel in the depth and perspective from a diff distance. And when I step into the picture, I lose that perspective. I've been practicing my flute now for a few years. This springtime, I'm determined to try to discover the robin's song and play it on my flute. I listen and listen. The robin's song does not yield its secrets quickly to my ear. So I ask my teachers and no one offers a music score or even an explanation for why there is no music score. A couple of years after the start of this quest, I ask one of the real mus musicians among my school friends and he suggests that perhaps the Robin song is full of many more frequencies than we can distinguish. I find a book in the school library, title long forgotten now, that shows pictures of the sound frequencies in the birds' songs. Yes, indeed, the robin and the meadowlark have deeply complex songs. So I think I'll return to just listening. From a distance like this, the depth and perspective of the robin's song does enwrap me in its magic. Depth with perspective is another element in beauty that draws me in. I knew something was wrong with my picture, my drawing, until an artist assigned me to draw a temple. He wanted a round gazebo-like structure with seven pillars. I tried, but it was really not good. 
Then he showed me how the pillars at the back of the circle of pillars must be slightly thinner than the pillars nearer the viewer. This made a huge difference in my satisfaction level with my art. He taught me how to try to achieve the sense of depth and perspective in my work. I'm drawing at my desk in school in Wisconsin. I'm in sixth grade and all my schoolwork is finished with A's and none of the other students are clamoring for my tutoring at the moment. So I'm drawing. It's a cricket. Anyone who drops by can see it's a cricket. It's a cricket from an earthworm's perspective. The thing fills the page and even kicks off the page with its hind legs. The grass it hides in runs off the top of the page. A cricket from a ground level perspective. Wherever I stand, I see things from a particular and specific perspective and I can discover depth. Yet sometimes it helps to stand back Get some distance, see the bigger picture, and not let the view of a hillock of grass or a cricket eclipse the view of the woods with its green carpet. I'm discussing in this section the idea of depth and perspective in the Bible. The front and center position is that Christ is its focal point. All other beauty in the Bible wraps around, directs the eye to, gives perspective to Jesus and the event of his entrance and impact in this world. So sometimes in my reading, I look away and see the big picture with Jesus and his love as my only and forever attraction. There are two other ways I suggest a stepping back to view the beauty of the Bible in its bigger picture. Someone once said that any book deserves to be read all the way through. The more I have read, the more I believe that. So I prefer to set myself to reading the one book of the Bible or one author's set of books. I'll read this set over and over until its big picture seeps into my soul, until I start fitting every little piece into a larger context. Students who attend my classes know that one of my rules is check the context. Reading and rereading a chosen book or set of books will help give you a sense also of the historical setting of the message. I encourage researching the historical setting in reliable sources and then returning to the Bible itself for reading in context. This is my way of gaining depth and perspective in my Bible reading. Secondly, I recommend reading the Bible through as it is, the whole Bible. Some people do this each year Reading and rereading the whole Bible discovers a general context for each part and each proposition. It puts each truth in its perspective as God preserved it for us in his word. I also recommend reading the Bible in chronological order. You can find my choice of order in uh, the back of this book. Read one whole book of the Bible at a time and read them in order according to their storyline. This way, even the puzzling books, like some of the minor prophets, slip more easily into place in the bigger picture. We're looking for depth of understanding, breadth of perspective, beauty that captivates. So I want to pray for us. <clears throat> well, Lord God in heaven, please grant us the time to read your Bible, to read it over and over, to take pieces of it, I mean, whole books of it and read them over and over. Well, Lord, grant us time with you in, the, in your word when we have uh, some, some project gets finished or aborted. Lord, let us use that time let us invest and commit that time to you. Oh, Lord, you are the one who can do anything. And so we honor and glorify you today. 
We thank you for the book of Revelation. We thank you for the, the many things that you have uh, said in that book to us. I thank you for beauty that captivates me in the book of Revelation. And Lord, I often fail to read your beauty or to notice it. And so I'm asking your forgiveness now. And in the light of that forgiveness, which you bought on Calvary, I am going ahead with our requests. You are the king of this world. And therefore, you have the right to handle our wars, our catastrophic catastrophic events or climate change and everyone whose life is affected. Lord, I'm thinking especially of those whose lives were affected by Hurricane Ian. I ask that you will be with the people in uh, Cuba, in Puerto Rico, in Florida and up the eastern coast. I ask that you will um, guard them with your strength and uh, draw them back to knowing you and knowing you more and more. Now, I thank you uh, for forgiving us. And I ask that you will continue to hear our prayers. There are big things that trouble us and smaller things that trouble us. You know, I'm thinking there may be someone who couldn't sleep last night and they really need their sleep. I ask that you will walk close with that person, grant them sleep or grant them a special walk with you. There may be some on our, on our prayer request lists who are sick or far away or very discouraged. You know what to do for them. And I'm so grateful that you do know and you can do. Lord, please bless our children. Some of them are afraid to go to school. You can help us. You know about the wars on our earth, so many places. You are sovereign for that also. So we ask you to cause the decisions to be made that will bring that will allow you to bring in your kingdom i know there's decisions being made in in meeting rooms all over this world for for many people and i ask that you will have ambassadors in those rooms that the decisions made will be those that can help can allow your kingdom to come in soon as in the prayer you taught us we are asking that your kingdom will come on earth and that your will will be done on earth. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you. And we will be doing this through all eternity. We've asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a screen I want to share with you. And I have to tell you, I haven't figured out how to get that last great thing off the screen, so we'll make it up. I'm Wilma Zalabach, preacher on the street, pastor of Grace Chapel Fellowship. Grace Chapel Fellowship is a church to bless other churches where listening is our unity. And yes, I have six enduring themes. One, God is good. Two, humans have been taken away from good. Three, Jesus came to bring us back. And four, God can, I can't, and I decide to let God. Two more, the Bible is worth reading and the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. And I will look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.